All right, so today we're talking about the SECURE Act. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are already familiar with a lot of the pieces of the SECURE Act and have a general understanding of how it works. So we're not gonna go through too much of the details of that, um, but more so we wanted to talk about how it is affecting our lives and your all's lives, whether you're a financial advisor or accountant, um, CPA, estate plan attorney, and, and really the way that we think that people should be thinking about this. Um, so Cameron Hamilton, unfortunately, just had, um, well, fortunately, just, they just had a new baby, so he's not with us today, but um, I think we we're, we're, have a good group of people to share some thoughts with everybody. So again, I'm Andy Reynolds, CEO and financial advocate at Ballast. Um, so this is some of the most significant legislation that's happened quite some time, in our opinion. You know, really it impacts IRA versus Roth IRA savings. We think it impacts retiree lifetime income distribution planning, beneficiary IRA distribution planning. We think also really anybody on this call, it really requires us to take a more proactive approach towards some of these things and coordinated approach, whether you're just a fiduciary or whether you're a trustee, um, whether you do investments or tax or legal, you know, really we think all of us need to come together to make really good planning opportunities here because, you know, down the road, there's going to be a short window where people can look back and say, you know, with rather simple math, did we do this right? And having done it right will really afford you a, a great opportunity looking forward. So, you know, the big, big change with the RMD rules, as most people know, on the left, the blue and the orange are the RMD requirements for the first generation. Second generation used to be in the gray and the yellow um, with, the, uh, with the orange and the yellow being required minimum distributions. This yellow is now in a much smaller target of a 10 year period. So that, that's the simplified version of, of the law. Um, what we want to do today is talk through different beneficiary payout strategies, strategies prior to an IRA um, becoming a beneficiary IRA, so the, the strategies during retirement um, and even before retirement, and then strategies to achieve the best results from us as professionals. And then the, what we would call somewhat chaos that is brought to the estate planning world and, and how to deal with that when you're trying to plan for, you know, anywhere from 10 to 50, 60, 70 years ahead of time. We wanted to start kind of taking a step back because we're going to talk a lot about Roth buckets right now. So Roth IRA contributions, Roth 401k contributions, Roth conversions. Um, we are huge advocates of Roth money, especially people who are still saving money and even into retirement through Roth conversions. Um, we, we generally feel like most people could benefit from having some degree of Roth money. I think there's some stereotypical reasons for that, such as you know taxes increasing in the future, whether tax rates go up or whether you just are young and, and you have low income and you're gonna make more money in the future. You know, there are no currently, under current law, no RMD requirements um, tax-free growth, access to your basis. Um, and, and so those are on the surface, really good reasons for Roth. Um, but we just wanted to share with you some additional reasons because it's going to play into some of our thoughts as we talk about the SECURE Act. Um, one of them being less variables in retirement. So if we knew when somebody was going to retire, exactly how much they need and when they're going to die, retirement planning would be easy. But we don't know that. Um, one of the variables affecting retirement is taxes. If tax rates go up, you the next day are going to have less purchasing power in your pre-tax account. So Roth helps hedge against that. If you pay tax while, you while you're earning money, it really allows you to prepay retirement taxes. It also, from a behavioral finance standpoint, helps both sides of the equation. So you live on less during your working years. So it coaches you to live on less and it also puts more money in your pocket down the road. And you're actually even dollar for dollar getting more, more purchasing power down the road. It also gives you more, if you're maxing out things, it gives you more money in a tax preferenced account. So, you know, most everybody's clients, 
you know, there, there's a number at which they feel good about. And a lot of the times that's maxing something out, whether it's an IRA or Roth IRA or 401k, it's an arbitrary number. But for whatever reason, from a behavioral finance standpoint, when you max it out, you feel good about that. So from that simple standpoint, maxing out a Roth 401k versus maxing out a pre-tax 401k, ultimately you have a lot more money that's in a tax preferenced um, purchasing power environment in the Roth bucket. It also in retirement allows for one-time purchases where you're not taking money out at your highest tax bracket and potentially moving up in your tax brackets. So for example, you want to buy a you know, $300,000, $500,000 vacation house or retirement, if it's all pre-tax money, you're taking that money out at the highest tax rate, more likely than not. Um, again, a hedge against means testing. Um, so Social Security is means tested. There's a lot of talk about further means testing with Social Security. Uh, Medicare is means tested, so based on income. So it's a hedge under current the way it's done currently against future means testing. And again, you're, you're distributing the tax liability over your lifetime, not just over the retirement years. So with that, let's jump into the SECURE Act information. Uh, my part today is gonna be talking about a 10 year payout. So this is a beneficiary who inherited the money and trying to deal with how you take the money out over that 10 year period. Um, I, I think there's a lot, and we'll talk about how you do planning proactively ahead of time later. But right now, we're just going to look at a beneficiary who just inherited the money and what can we do to, to help with that strategy. So the big thing that we really feel is there's not a good set of blanket advice. Um, I, I think it really is going to be individually dependent. I think it also needs to be annually determined. Um, and we have to be paying attention to the market, um, you know, market performance, as well as people's individual tax situations on an annual basis. So we really don't feel like it's one blanket advice you could give or a beginning of 10 years, you give the advice and you don't revisit it ever. I think both of those are, would be um, not giving the best advice looking forward. So we just want to show some examples of how you could possibly handle this based on different situations. Um, one would be a beneficiary with lower income. Um, you know, ideally in these situations, we want to try to get the money out of the IRA in a tax efficient manner. Obviously, if this is a $10,000 beneficiary IRA, maybe you just wait until the 10th year and, and it makes a lot of sense to do that. But if we're going to have large distributions and someone has low income, it may make sense given the priorities of that person to take it out evenly over, over those 10 years so that you're filling up the lower tax brackets each year as you go through it. Another idea with a early low income earner, later higher income earner, such as a medical student or medical resident, would be to take more out early so that way, again, filling up the lower tax brackets with this money, trying to get the money out in a lower tax environment, knowing that later they're going to have much higher income. So on the, these charts, the orange is always the IRA withdrawal and the blue is the earned income. Somebody who may be in an environment where the income is, is fluctuating. So it's someone in sales or 1099 income. We'll talk about a business owner here shortly. Um, there's, uh, this is really where we feel like it makes sense to, to really each year be paying close attention to income. It may be worthwhile to set a number and say, you know, probably depending on tax brackets, say we're only going to take this much out and we'll figure out the rest down the road. You want to do some good math at the beginning, but if you set a threshold of, you know, you have this much income, we're going to take income up to this high then that allows you to have a good plan of, of moving forward. Tax brackets are really going to dictate a lot of that planning around the variable income. Another idea is a beneficiary who's charitably inclined, um, and this can be done in two different ways. One would be a upfront large donation. I think, you know, um, you see a lot of these, I want to make an impact type donations and if someone's going to inherit a large beneficiary IRA, 
depending on how much they can um, deduct from their on their tax return, the charitable distribution um, or donation in line with a large beneficiary IRA withdrawal would make a lot of sense to offset the taxes of those two events. Similarly, with a bunching strategy, so bunching, you know, from a charitable standpoint with a high standard deduction that we have right now, you, you'll see two, potentially three years of bunching donations into a given time period to try to offset and get more than the standard deduction. The same thing could be done when considering the beneficiary IRA. So in this example, you have the ability to make a charitable dedu deduction or excuse me, donation every four years or so, and you accumulate that, which gets you above the standard deduction. And, then, and at that point, then try to take out um, a little bit more from the beneficiary IRA, again, with tax rates being the primary objective. Business owners, so we see business owners, um, depending on the industry, sometimes have significant losses. Um, this allows us to pair those losses with additional IRA withdrawals. You know, it's important that those losses are going to offset ordinary income, um, but similar to when we're talking about variable income, whenever we have low income or losses to offset, it definitely is going to be something to consider when withdrawing money out of the beneficiary IRA. And again, targeting a tax bracket, you know, is kind of the, the main theme here, um, but there may be, depending on how tax brackets are today and how they may change in the future. If you can target a tax bracket to where there might be a large jump to the next tax bracket, it may make sense to withdraw up to a certain amount in that, in that tax bracket each year um, to keep them up below a certain threshold. Our opinion is if it's you know going 2% higher to another tax bracket, it may not be significant enough to to make a significant change. Um, but if you're jumping up significantly in the marginal tax rate, it may make a lot of sense to, to consider. The market cycle is something really to, to consider here as well. Um, and there's degree of forward looking guidance that you have to take into consideration. But if you're looking at the end of a calendar year and the market has sold off significantly it definitely would make sense to, to take some out at that time. And it may make sense to um, even take a little bit more out at that time. Um, you know, there's some significant math that has to go into that because if the market is low, you may be taking the money out and, and then just setting yourself up for capital gains exposure as the market rebounds. Um, so you really have to think about that. The other thing to consider is, uh, when the market is selling off. So if you're at a 40% sell-off, but it's February um, and, and you take a lot more out thinking that the market is, is low, by the time December 31st rolls around, um, the market actually may be a little bit higher. So um, just keep it in mind those things when we're thinking about taxes, I think is, is really important. So with that, that's, that's our big part of looking at the beneficiary who's already inherited the money and how to deal with those situations. Um, you know, it's really, this is from a tax perspective and withdrawing the money out of the account. Obviously, the longer you hold it in the portfolio, the more tax deferred growth there'll be. Um, and, and Roth money plays an even better story, but when we're looking at this purely from a tax standpoint and trying to get the money out in the lowest tax environment, we have to think about a methodical approach that's revisited continually. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Burton to keep the conversation going. Thanks, Andy. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Brian Burton, uh, Director of Portfolio Strategy and Financial Advocate at Ballast. Um, Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, it's great to virtually be with, with all of you uh, today. So where Andy was focused more on the beneficiary and the tenure, different tenure payout strategies, I'm going to focus more on the current account owner and strategies both pre and post retirement uh, and more specifically lifetime income distribution strategies. Uh, so when we think about uh, different distribution strategies, um, 
prior to the SECURE Act, uh, many folks follow what, we, what we're calling the kind of an old school strategy or traditional approach. And whenever I utter the words old and school together, I, I can't help but think of our, our friend Frank the Tank here. So, but anyway, it's, uh, this old school approach was simply uh, to pump as much money as possible um, into you know, traditional 401k plans, uh, 403b plans while working, and to leave that money alone as long as possible, with, withdraw as little um, as we could for as long as we could, and, and hopefully to uh, leave a sizable IRA uh, to the next generation, uh, which they, prior to the SECURE Act, could, could stretch withdrawals over the course of their lifetime. So now with the death of, of the stretch, um, this tradition, tr traditional approach has, has definitely become uh, far less effective. So we're looking at new strategies and, and try to think about what our goals are as financial advocates for our clients um, in this new era. So our goal is, is to help our clients uh, design and, and to stick to um, kind of a plan that's focused on hitting these customized desirable targets. Um, so, so as an example, we, we may look to target uh, a specific dollar amount for, for Roth conversion that will help fill up a client's current uh, tax bracket. Um, ideally, that uh, is at least $31,110 that we can convert at this point state tax-free, take advantage of that. Uh, we may also target um, a spe specific RMD amount uh, so that our client, once retired and RMDs kicked in, they're not forced to withdraw um, an unnecessary large amount uh, causing a, an unnecessary tax liability. Um, another strategy we may look to incorporate is um, a specific inherited IRA dollar amount. So we're keeping beneficiary tax brackets in, in mind. Uh, so how much should we pass on in the form of IRA dollars, Roth money, non-qualified taxable investments? And should those accounts just be split equally for multiple beneficiaries? Um, thinking about it, even if they're in two uh, drastically different tax brackets, um, so take, for example, uh, if we have a client uh, with two adult children who she plans to pass all of her assets onto, that million dollar IRA uh, would net, you know, a, a modest income earner uh, quite a bit more than it would a child who's a, maybe a business owner and in the top tax bracket, uh, while a Roth uh, account would be much more valuable uh, to the high income earner. So we try to help clients equalize um, the inheritance while considering uh, the next generation's uh, tax status. So let's, uh, let's look at a quick case study here. So this client is 60 years old, uh, plans to retire at age 66, currently has 250K in income, uh, has an IRA and a non-qualified investment account, uh, both worth one and a half million. She's gonna need 200,000 in income when she retires and will have Social Security and pension income at 60K a year, and she plans to pass all of her assets on to her adult children. So with the old school traditional planning strategy, uh, here's an illustration. So from age 60 while working up until retirement at 66, um, she will live strictly on her wages, uh, continue to pump money into her 401k uh, while employed. And once she retires, uh, she will be living off of her Social Security pension income. And then we're going to supplement her income need with withdrawals from the taxable or non-qualified investment account. Uh, then at age 72, her RMDs will kick in. And from that point on, she will live on a combination of Social Security, uh, non-qualified withdrawals, and RMDs uh, for the remainder of her life, which in this illustration is age 90. So a more modern income planning approach. So for the remainder of this client's working years, uh, we're gonna do Roth conversions of 31,110 each year, uh, help whittle down the pre-tax dollars, uh, decrease future RMDs and hopefully future tax burdens. Then at retirement, uh, instead of drawing from the non-qualified money, uh, we will instead supplement our client's income need uh, with IRA withdrawals um, until all of the pre-tax dollars are exhausted 
uh, here in this illustration at age 81. And then from 81 to the rest of her life, we will supplement her income need with non-qualified withdrawals. So 30 years later, uh, down the road, which scenario has benefited our client the greatest? Uh, with a traditional strategy, uh, she would be left with around $1.8 million all in a traditional IRA, uh, which in this scenario would be fully taxable to her beneficiaries within 10 years of inheritance. With a modern strategy, our client would be left with just under $1.2 million in a taxable investment account and $750,000 in a Roth IRA uh, and zero in traditional IRAs. Uh, so the taxable money uh, would get a full step up in basis at death uh, and the Roth IRA comes with a zero tax liability. So not, our, not only are we passing on more money to the next generation, but we're doing so in a much more efficient manner. So our key takeaways, we're looking to do early Roth conversions to take advantage of paying taxes now uh, while hopefully in a lower tax bracket. Uh, don't forget about the state tax exclusion on the first 31-110 that we distribute from IRAs, which makes Roth conversions even that more appealing. Uh, don't lose sight of the importance of a step up in basis at death on the non-qualified investment account. Uh, that can be huge, a huge savings for the beneficiaries um, on highly appreciated securities. And lastly, positioning assets in these more optimal tax buckets uh, allows for much more efficient trust planning, uh, which John will discuss in greater detail in just a few minutes. So that concludes my comments. Um, I'll now pass it over to Frank Yoswick. Frank. Hi hey everyone, I'm Frank Oswick, and uh, Director of Estate Planning and Tax and Financial Advocate here at Ballast. And today, I'm gonna to talk to you all about achieving the best result and how we go about doing that uh, with an inherited retirement account under the SECURE Act. So prior to the SECURE Act, the inherited retirement account question was a lot easier. You know, in many cases, really in, in most cases, it, it made a lot of sense just to stretch the RMD over the lifetime of the beneficiary. So just like here in this tic-tac-toe example, it's easy to say, you know, what X should do next? Win the game. Uh, but now with, with the passage of the SECURE Act and with the 10-year withdrawal rule, it's not that simple anymore. There's a lot more factors that go into the decision of what you should do. So let's take a hypothetical situation here. We've got a million dollar inherited IRA. And we have our beneficiary who's a scientist working at a university. So it's a good, it's a stable job, uh, maybe just not in the highest tax bracket. So what's the best strategy for this beneficiary? Well, in this case, given, given what we know, um, it may make sense to take even annual withdrawals. Well, let's think, what if we just change one variable about our beneficiary? So now rather than working at a university, it's the same situation, but there are scientists in a biotech company that, that might change the world. So the income has the potential to skyrocket in the next five to 10 years. So then all of a sudden you're looking at the top tax bracket um, within the 10 year withdrawal window. So the optimal strategy here, it may make sense then to take accelerated withdrawals. Now, very few situations are going to be the same, and there's always going to be these swing variables. So when you look at different situations or scenarios that even appear similar at first, there are going to be different swing variables that can affect the decision of what to do with the inherited account under the SECURE Act. So these are the kind of things that you need to be looking at. You need to be considering these if you want to achieve the best results. So it's the size of the IRA, the annual income of the uh, beneficiary. Uh, you know, all the way down the market cycle, their health in the prior example, their career trajectory, all these different variables and more need to be considered to make sure that you're getting the best result. So after the SECURE Act was signed into law, we think that that really reinforced this idea that financial advisors and all financial professionals, so this is attorneys and CPAs included, must do real financial planning. You know, just like we financial advisors don't just rely on a 4% withdrawal rule or plug client information into a Monte Carlo simulation and, and roll with it. 
you know, what, when it comes to working with the SECURE Act, especially done properly, you can create a lot of value. But conversely, there's a lot of room for error that could lead to a disaster if you don't do it right. So it's really imperative to know and to understand those swing variables that we were talking about on the prior slide and to understand that you cannot just set it and forget it. You can't just uh, do, do one thing in year one and say, good to go for the next 10 years. Properly administering an inherited retirement account after the SECURE Act was passed, it's going to require continual monitoring. Um, and we think coordination as well. So with these changes brought on by the SECURE Act, begs the question, who is responsible? Is it the attorney? Is it the CPA? Is it a financial advisor? Now, here's an important note here. I, I want to make this point. These are just listed in alphabetical order. I was not trying to point any kind of uh, liability fingers here at anybody. Um, so just as a side note there. As another note, it's great on a Zoom meeting as I can't tell who's actually uh, laughing at that terrible joke. Um, so anyway, who's responsible and who are they responsible to and what are they responsible for? So you're definitely going to be responsible to your client in the current generation. And what are you responsible for? Well, to achieve the best results. And, and what is the best result? That's going to depend on the client. You know, is it saving the most money while working or is it spending the most while they're younger? Is it deferring taxes as long as possible or is it paying the taxes up front? Is it having this grand, luxurious retirement and spending all the money that you've saved throughout your working career? Or is it setting up the beneficiary? Now, if the beneficiary is your client, what's the best result for that? Is it tax efficiency, the use of the money now? Is it having the most money at the end of the 10-year period? Well, what happens if you defer everything, defer all the distributions to the end, and you see a bad market environment in the 10th year? Well, what happens if the next generation is not your client? Are you still responsible to them? And I hate to touch on this earlier, but 10 years is not that long for someone to use their hindsight power and look back and say, well, you would have, could have, should have done this or that. So, you know, to the attorneys on the call, if you're administering an estate where a beneficiary inherits a large IRA or the CPA is listening in, if you have a client that shows up with a newly inherited IRA, do you want the responsibility of tackling that all your own? You know, do you want to be potentially the one left holding the bag? So our philosophy with this, it's simple, really. To achieve the best result, coordination between the professionals is required. So the attorney, the CPA, the financial advisor all need to be working together. So when it comes to achieving the best result under the SECURE Act, you've got to know the full picture. You've got to know and understand all the aspects of your client's financial life. So their income needs, their goals, their taxes, their family situation, their estate plan, their desires. You really should know that next the gen, uh, beneficiary generation as well. You know, understanding the beneficiary generation and understanding their situation, that's going to help you planning, help the current generation optimize their planning to have the best starting point for the next generation when they inherit. So how do you get to know that full picture? How do you know everything? By working with and sharing information between all the other professionals. So our perspective is the financial advisors, you know, when, a, when one of our clients is starting or revisiting their estate plan, we want to be involved to ensure the total coverage of their full financial picture. But when a client's thinking about Roth conversions, we know how much money they have in their account. But the CPAs are going to know the tax code and know the intricacies of their individual returns better than anyone. So for all these different things, though, we believe that the financial advisor is in the best position to be the facilitator, to be the quarterback, you know, to coordinate the work between all these professionals. We know these clients really well. We talk to them about their finances and their investments, but we also talk to them about their taxes and their estate plans. You know, we get to know their personal situations too. We know they have a new hobby or a new pet. We know how their kids are doing. We know where their kids are applying to school. We know if their kids got a new job. Uh, we talk routinely about anything and, and everything. So again, our philosophy, this coordination between the professionals is required. When all the professions coordinate and work together, so you've got the financial advisor, the CPA, the attorney, all pulling in the same direction. You know, in any relationship, 
but especially on new things like the SECURE Act, that's when you can achieve the best result. So each of you have a level of professional expertise in your field, and then that's just compounded when we all work together. And it's also true that when we work together, we make each other look good. Uh, but again, most importantly, that's when we can achieve the best result for our clients. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to John. All right. Frank, thank you. And I want to thank everyone again for joining us today. Um, it, uh, it's a pleasure to get in front of you all. And uh, in these unusual times, we appreciate everyone's attendance. Uh, again, I'm John Boardman, founder and CEO of Financial Advocate here at Ballast, um, and uh, I am the last person to speak, so I would do want to encourage any questions that you all have to type those in, either in the Q&A or the chat function at the bottom of the screen. We'll be sure to answer those before the presentation is over. So what I want to focus my section on is you know, some of the chaos that's been created by this law. And I think more than anything, and more importantly than ever, as planners, particularly you all as estate planners, uh, when you're drafting estate plans for your clients to consider, does this retirement account that I'm uh, looking at for my client, does that actually need to pass through their trust plan? And we all know it's there's a wide variety of sort of financial makeups. So we'll have some clients that have 5% of their assets in retirement accounts. We'll have some clients that have over 95% of their assets in retirement accounts. And, and obviously that dictates how much um, that those retirement accounts are impactful to their beneficiaries, but even more so with their family situation, how that needs to be considered. Because what we're showing you here today is that because IRAs and retirement accounts have to be paid out over a 10 year period, it could complicate a lot of existing estate plans, um, and it really changes the way we look at estate planning moving forward. So there's really one question, what is worth more? Is it control of retirement accounts after someone passes away or limiting taxes? Because what we know is that we have two options. One, if we run it through a trust and it's a conduit trust, it all gets to, it all, it's all paid out. So whatever comes out of the IRA is gonna be distributed to the beneficiary that doesn't create a lot of control. It limits it to that 10 year period of time. The nice thing about that, however, is that it keeps the tax burden uh, probably lowest because it's subject to the income bracket of the, of the beneficiary, the recipient of that income. But in a discretionary trust or a trust that allows assets to accumulate, um, that can create a problem. So over that 10 years, the IRA gets paid out, but if some of those assets are retained, uh, you could run into a situation where it gets taxed at that higher trust income level. And so trustees, um, I think, will have to consider this if they're given the flexibility to do so. But I think estate planners, drafters, uh, most importantly, need to consider, um, could they be painting their clients into a corner where assets are going to be retained and potentially penalized from a tax standpoint because of that retention? How important is it that those dollars are actually retained? I want to go through sort of a hypothetical scenario that I think would be sort of an ideal way that you could deal with someone that has you know uh, significant retirement account assets as well as significant non-qualified non-retirement assets. So if we think about this situation, a $3 million trust, a million of which is in an IRA, all the funds are to be held in trust with discretionary income stream to the beneficiary, um, that the trustee would have flexibility around income and the source from which they pay that income. Um, all IRA assets must be paid out by the end of the 10th year. We know that. That's what we're talking about today as it relates to the SECURE Act. And the trustee has sort of an income goal of $150,000 per year for the beneficiary and a goal that I think most people share is just minimizing taxes. I think that's the one place that we know that we're, we're always judged on our advice based on the tax bill uh, that, that it might uh, create or reduce for the client. So in this scenario, uh, just over a 20 year time period, um, and this is a very simplified version of, of how this might look, but what we essentially have is all of the income for the first 10 years of the beneficiaries receiving the income coming from the IRA. The idea there is that we, we know that money has to come out of the IRA, so we're utilizing that law to our advantage and we're 
allowing the trustee to not take any income from the other trust, the non-qualified assets uh, over that 10 year period. This would require a couple critical things. One, you would have to make certain that leading in to sort of an end of life planning scenario that you would have a conversation with your client around what their current balances are. Uh, secondarily, it would require proactive planning after someone passes away to make sure, very similar to what Andy discussed, to make sure that you were optimizing that distribution schedule. So a set it and forget it plan um, is not one that would usually work. If tax minimization is actually your goal, you need to make sure that this is an ongoing conversation. I think this is a great opportunity for all of us to show our best work and to collaborate together to come up with the best plan for the client. Um, taxes don't have to be the only thing by which we're judged, but we all know that uh, in our client's eyes, that is something that we're judged by. But at the same point, a dollar saved in taxes is hopefully a dollar more that's left for the beneficiary um, to receive. So uh, I think it's just something we need to be conscious that if you are going to run an estate uh, through uh, retirement assets through a trust, we need to make sure that we provide the flexibility to the beneficiary, excuse me, to the trustee. Um, so from what sources, when and for whom, if you can provide that amount of flexibility, I think that's going to be important moving forward. We are working with clients now where we it doesn't take much forecasting forward, where we're looking now at high seven figure to eight figure type balances on retirement accounts. So we're talking about significant sums of money that are going to have to be planned around. Um, it, it is There's no question that this becomes far less important for people with small retirement account balances. But for those you know, doctors that have worked at UK for 40 years and have been getting that nice match over that period of time, we could be looking at significant retirement account balances. And we need to make sure that that's taken into consideration when the, when the trust is designed. Um, teapot trust, which is just tax efficient allocation, um, the idea there is that, you know, you give the trustee the ability to be flexible and they can pull from uh, whatever source. If you think about the analogy of teapots and sort of pouring from one and then from another to optimize where it's best to come from in each, um, each year, I think that's a great thing. The other thing is just consider naming a charity. There, I think with this new rule in place, this 10-year distribution schedule, it makes a great deal of sense to think about charities as the beneficiaries of retirement accounts. If you have clients that are charitably inclined, um, don't um, don't immediately dismiss the idea of using the retirement accounts for that. I think non-qualified assets and Roth assets, what we're seeing here, it is just reiterating the fact that they are just easier to plan around. Um, and one way to address that is in your while you're working with a client, particularly if they're in their sort of, you know, uh, 50, 60 years old, and we think they have a, a you know several decades left potentially, um, consider converting funds to Roth. If they have significant retirement accounts and they've never really thought of themselves as a Roth sort of eligible investor, we have a number of clients who sort of don't really think of themselves as someone that would be um, appropriate for a Roth. What we're showing you here today is that for almost every client we sit down with, uh, there is an opportunity uh, to to put some of their dollars in Roth, either by conversion or future contribution. And in doing so, it it, it provides a great deal of flexibility uh, in their estate planning. So some, conc some concluding thoughts, a um, number of planning issues. Um, and I think there will be more to surface as this sorts of plays itself out. I mean, we're just now dealing with some of the immediate repercussions of the of the SECURE Act. And I think we'll run into new scenarios and, and new problems. And, and I think it's just gonna be important for all of us, again, to coordinate that advice and share what we learn in the scenarios when we're working with our clients. There is an immediate pressing need. I know I've talked to a number of attorneys who have reached out to their clients about this and considering updating their beneficiaries. If this trust planning doesn't seem to be appropriate anymore, is it doesn't make sense to just do uh, beneficiary designations directly to children, for instance. Uh, have had a number of clients consider that. And we're going to continue to reiterate this point that Roth helps in almost every scenario. Um, we have done a ton of study on Roth uh, over the last few years, really running every scenario at it. And um, it, we, we, we would be 
happy to have that conversation with you. If you're not someone who is convinced that Roth is appropriate for virtually everyone, um, we can we can often make that argument. So we'd love the opportunity to have that conversation with you if you're interested.